It was totally the opposite of the old constitution. Uh, we're all equal as citizens, whereas previously we were divided into different classes and groups. And all our languages have equal status, except, as you'll see later, not all. Um, right. So everybody knows English. It's, it's a, rapidly becoming a, more and more of a global language, but it's also was the last colonial language that we had, so it's still de facto the uh, lingua franca of South Africa. Um, Afrikaans and English were the two official languages under the apartheid regime. Um, Afrikaans is technically called a Creole language. Creole meaning its, it's, a, it's origin is a combination or an interaction between colonial and colonized, right? So there are many Creole languages around the world. Some are derived from French, some from Portuguese, uh, you, you name it. Afrikaans is a Creole language. Um, then the other nine official languages belong to the Bantu language group, which is found in approximately half of Africa uh, contains Bantu languages. Um, so we have nine, most of them are also spoken in some of the neighboring countries in, in, by a considerable part of the population. Among those nine, uh, four of them belong to the Nguni language group and they're somewhat mutually intelligible. Another three belong to the Sututswana group and they're also somewhat mutually intelligible. Then we have Chivenda and Shitsonga. Um, if you'll note the spelling of Shitsonga, I'll, I'll get back to it just now. Okay, now when you see where I, where I said the nine Bantu languages, there's an asterisk that refers to the fact that they have various degrees of Khoisan influence. Unlike most of the Bantu languages in the rest of Africa, um, the South Afri or Southern African Bantu languages, most of them have some degree of influence such as click phonemes of which there are actually, you know, hundreds of subtle variations. And this indicates many centuries of interaction. Um, unlike the apartheid narr narrative, which kind of tried to portray Bantu people, Bantu language speaking people have, as having arrived almost at the same time as the, as the colonial uh, arrival. So both uh, the linguistic and the archaeological and the DNA evidence all suggest many, many centuries of interaction between the Khoisan and the Bantu groups. All right, so we'll leave English for now. Everyone knows about it. Afrikaans, what many people don't know, uh, which was kind of swept under the carpet during apartheid, is that the, the oldest by far, the oldest written Afrikaans was written in the Arabic script. You can look this up in Wikipedia. Even the Afrikaans Wikipedia has a good article about Arabic Afrikaans. And the reason for this is that uh, in the early part of the last century, or no, the other, the 19th century, um, the, the Cape Town Madrasa, which is a Muslim religious school, uh, had, which had been teaching in what they, they then called the Malay language, uh, which is, would nowadays be called Indonesian, because people were sp hardly speaking that language anymore, it became impractical. So they actually started to write down the language that they were speaking day to day, which at that time was considered like kitchen Dutch. Okay, but because it was written in the Arabic script, which is phonetic, we can, you know, people who can read Arabic script can read it out, and it sounds more like Afrikaans than like Dutch. So that was the oldest written Afrikaans uh, in, in the early 1800s. Then in the later part of the 1800s, um, this, the, the non-Muslims also started to write it down, but they, they only got serious with translating the Bible in 1923, and then the, uh, the government recognized it in 25. The Bantu languages, um, they all have different timelines of when they were first written down by missionaries, mostly or somewhere around the mid-1800s, 
And the missionaries came from various colonial powers, Portuguese, French, and British mostly. Shitsonga was transcribed by Portuguese. That's why it's spelled with an X, which in, in the uh, Nguni languages, the X would be a click. But uh, in Portuguese orthography, the X is a she or a sh sound. So Shitsonga is spelled with an X. Okay, so we arrived at the New South Africa with all these languages. Um, a former political prisoner called Neville Alexander, he was on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela. So by that fact, you can tell that he wasn't classified as white, but otherwise he would have been in Pretoria Central, which is where I nearly ended up. Um, he proposed that the, na the number of languages should be official languages could be reduced by standardizing those groups that I mentioned earlier. So we would have ended up with six national languages instead of 11, but it, politically it, it, there was no traction. Apartheid and colonialism had succeeded in creating uh, what, what seemed natural to people to be separated and divided like that. So uh, it, it was perpetuated until today. And, okay, the only Khoisan language with a significant number of people speaking it in South Africa is Nama, sometimes called Khoi Khoi and various other things. Um, but most of its speakers live in Namibia and Botswana. We have maybe 60,000 in South Africa. In Namibia, we can, we can hear a bit more from some of the, the, the Namibian Wikimedians just now maybe. They do actually have uh, like academic processes in that language. All right, the actual Wikipedias. Just a few weeks or months ago, Afrikaans reached 50,000, right? Um, Afrikaans obviously representing a much more privileged sort of demographic profile than the other um, languages than English in South Africa. Internet access being the biggest determining factor. Um, the second one, Supedi, also known as Northern Sutu or Sisutu Saleboa, um, is like eight times as big as Isizulu, which has actually just passed a thousand during the course of Wikimania with the help of some, yeah. So this, this figure that I give here is, is, is slightly out of date. Um, so yeah, Supedi has, is eight times as large as the, the, the next one. and. Uh, all the rest are really small and the, the, their growth is static. Potential wiki, uh, Wikipedias, Isindebele, which is an official language in South Africa, but it's also the second major language of Zimbabwe. It's still in incubator status. Um, Nama, I've, I've heard since I produced these slides that it's also technically in incubator status. Again, we can hear a bit from the uh, Namibian Wikipedians, I think, later. But I think that maybe uh, we should try and like generate some process within this Wikimania so that uh, we can try and like see how uh, Nama could come out of incubator one day. Okay, this is a, just some some research that I did into the statistics given by the Wikimedia Foundation on their uh, Wikistats website. The important thing to, about this graph is that it's a logarithmic scale. The vertical axis is logarithmic, so anything that's twice as high is 10 times the size. Uh, if, if I didn't display it like that, English would be, you know, above the ceiling. And, um, so anyway, that, uh, I know you, you're all sitting, those sitting at the back can't see, the blue line is English, of, uh, the red line, the second one is Afrikaans. Uh, well, you're sitting at the back, I'll, if you want to see better, come closer. <laughs> Um, so, you can see the, the uh, Afrikaans is well above the other, the Bantu languages. So now to get, to be able to look at the Bantu languages more, more accurately, I'm getting rid of English and Afrikaans and, and using an arithmetic scale on the, on the vertical axis. So now you can compare them to each other instead of comparing them to English and Afrikaans. Now you can see the dramatic difference between Sepedi and Isizulu and this is closer and all the others. Um, and it, how fairly recent it is, actually. 
um, the, 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 uh, the horizontal axis is the years, right? If, what I did was I took a sample at September of every year, the size of those Wikipedias. Then I looked at the, the number of contributors, in other words, the, the, the communities that create the Wikipedias. And here, uh, you'd expect maybe that Sepedi would have more contributors because it's got eight times more articles, but no. Um, Isizulu is, uh, okay, what, sorry, I'll, I'll get back to those. First, I'm also showing, I've gone back to a logarithmic scale with English and Afrikaans. Um, so let's get rid of them, get back to an arithmetic display. Here you can see uh, Sepedi is blue, so it's, it's, it's in the middle and it's got like only a, less than half of the Isizulu contributors, although it's got eight times as many articles. Um, I wasn't able to really um, document how that came to be. That's for someone else to research, or maybe I'll do it at some stage. But uh, it, I just didn't get it done at this, in this stage. So the, the, the number of contributors is also like not growing as fast as one would hope. But the only thing that is growing very well is page views. Okay, we're back on a logarithmic scale now, so it doesn't look too dramatic. But what you can see is that English and Afrikaans are actually, the number of page views per year has declined, interestingly enough. This is worldwide, right? Not just in South Africa. Um, the other thing I should point out that around 2015, there was a redefinition of what constitutes a page view. So that would explain some of the strange disruptions at that, at that point. But the, the good news is that generally, the Bantu languages have a steady upward slope, which is seemingly continuing, uh, which is much better than the, you know, English and Afrikaans. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about possible ways forward. This is what they're talking about next door right now as well. Um, what can be done for smaller Wikipedias to, to assist them? So the, uh, Wikipedia has a, a machine translate, machine assisted translation tool. Um, I didn't know until this Wikimania started, well the pre-conference in the last couple of days, I found out that the actual um, machine translation is outsourced to Yandex, which is a Russian company. So w what Wikimania does is, uh, Wikipedia does is like the user interface rather than the actual uh, translation. And f I found it doesn't have much support, hardly any support for Bantu languages. So, you know, I was going to try and say that as the Wikimedia Foundation, they should remedy that and it wouldn't be too difficult because it's, because of the similarity of many of the, many of the languages. But now that they say it's, it's outsourced to Yandex, um, I asked the question, could they perhaps be able to link up to other providers at the same time, like local ones? The University of Cape Town, for example, is doing quite a bit of research in a machine translation. And so maybe we could experiment with supplementing the, uh, the service as it is. Another thing that they're probably talking about next door is using Wikidata to, to, to generate article placeholders, which are like the framework of a future article with the basic things like dates and statistics already filled in. So that uh, editors in creating articles, they would, they would have like a, a suggested framework. The big thing that I want to talk about um, I, th I hope most of you in your in your welcome pack you got a little f little thing like this that says Kiwix on it, right? If you have a look, you might find it. Most people won't know what it is, but if if you take it out, uh, there's a little. It's actually a little uh, sticker that you take off this card, and you can put it on your your laptop webcam. It's a shutter, so you can open and close your webcam, and it's got a little slogan on it that says "Go offline." Because Kiwix is an offline uh, web hosting system for content, not only Wikipedia articles, but largely it was largely developed for them. Kiwix has also just entered into a, a huge new um, funding agreement with the Wikimedia Foundation. I think it's 250 million just a couple of days ago as well. 
So um, we have a lot to hope for that we would be able to make uh, educational content, including Wikipedia, available to places that have no internet or to people who can't afford it. Because a lot of people live and there's like um, data signals passing through their, their bodies and their spaces all the time, but they can't afford to access them. But with, uh, with Kiwix and fairly cheap devices like Raspberry Pis, we can actually provide Wi-Fi hotspots where you don't need to pay to use the data. You can ha uh, all you'd need is maybe a phone or a tablet, which are becoming more and more affordable as time goes by. Zero rating. On our, uh, when we had the, the thing where we, we, we sort of suggested words in that word cloud thing earlier on, it was in the top 10 of the words among the dragons and goats, zero rating. And that's also because the youngsters from Sin Jongo High School pointed out how crucial it had been for them. Um, I don't know how many of you know that just earlier this year, the Wikimedia Foundation announced that it was going to stop supporting zero rating, which I thought was a huge mistake. But I kind of understood what, why they were doing it, because at the time, there was a big debate uh, in America and in other countries about net neutrality. And they were lobbying for net neutrality to be legally mandated and compulsory. And uh, many people's understanding of net neutrality uh, is, is saying that like all content should have equal status online. Uh, things mustn't be boosted by being sponsored, whatever, whatever. So I think that's the kind of dogma that they were imposing. Personally, I can't see that we should have to separate, uh, like to, to, to generalize like that because um, each data packet can be handled the same by the network regardless of who's actually paying for it. And, th and we can actually monitor that. There are uh, tools for monitoring traffic. So, uh, you know, I would like to reopen that debate. Oops. 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 <laughs> okay, way forward. Um, in South Africa, I suppose probably in, in most of Africa and most of the so-called developing world, um, editor stones are not easy to at attract um, all social classes because transport is expensive. I mean, apartheid forced people to live far from each other. Um, so although we're supposed to be volunteers as Wikipedians, we, I think we ne really have to provide a transport allowances and refreshments for people who come from far to, to uh, Wikimedia events. So we should, we should start budgeting for those. The other thing is that uh, educational authorities and cultural authorities in South Africa are very out of touch with what Wikipedia is and what it can be. In other countries, the situation is very different. The session that's coming after, after this is, is about Africa's Wikipedias, where we, this kind of stuff will be covered in more detail. So um, the last thing I want to say is that uh, we need to continue having debating issues, OK? And some of them are raised by this. Oh, it's even more distorted on the slide there. OK, this is an academic paper that I came across by Heiko Wichers of Wake Forest University. And the key sentence that I've kind of underlined there, this paper argues that Wikipedia and indeed the internet itself favor Western mainstream languages and content. Um, if you read through the paper, you can sort of uh, criticize that statement. Maybe you sh we should criticize it, but we also have to understand the element of truth in it. And there are other similar criticisms that can be made. So I think uh, we, we shouldn't just say, yeah, yeah, we can be, we can provide Kiwix, we can do, we, like, make it happen. We should know that we have to be careful and, and uh, critical of, of what we're doing. Okay, thank you. I think there's time for one or two questions. Or else just come to the next session. Yeah. Oh, uh, can you, yeah, someone at the back. Stand up.
Yes. Uh, it's freely available on the Wikipedia website. Um, if you could, if you're going to be at the, the 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 next session after this, Africa's Wikipedia's, we'll cover it a in a bit more detail. But yeah, you, it's there's a, it's it's not quite ready for general use. You have to. It's somewhat experimental, but it is free and it is available. It's just that because it's using a, a, an external company, we. We, we, you know, there, there's issues of uh, language support that has to be negotiated. Yeah. Yes, Dion. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dion. Yeah. Oh, yes. Come on. A proposal. Well, it's got, it's got, the question is about Neil Alexander, Neville Alexander's proposal to standardize languages. It would have had advantages and disadvantages because, I mean, in the same way that English, for example, used to have many different dialects and uh, it's more and more becoming a standardized, globalized language. And so a lot of that diversity is being lost. But because English speaking population contains sufficient affluence and internet access, people who want to preserve variants of forms of English are able to start their own Wikipedias and um, they have fun with Middle English and whatever they want to do, right? But for these very small Bantu language Wikipedias, it would have probably been a good thing if they could have been uh, sort of consolidated at some stage and then only once they're really up and running with a critical mass of users and contributors, maybe then they could start sort of splitting into dialects and whatever, but uh, it was a matter of political will. Uh, the political will didn't exist, so it didn't happen. Which languages would have been combined? Well, as I was saying, the, the Nguni group, which contains Isizulu, Isikosa, Siswati, and Isindebele, that was, that w the proposal was to standardize, to, to create a, f a standard form of Nguni, and then a standard form of Sututswana. So that would have uh, made seven into two. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm sure they're somewhat in mutually intelligible as well. They both would be members of the uh, Guni. Perhaps you could say they were dialects of, of, the, of the same language. Um, this issue will also be covered in the next session. The, the, the whole debate about what makes a language a language and not, not a dialect of another language. There's one definition, sort of a wisecrack, that says, if it has its own army, it's a language. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's a political decision, yes. Yeah. So uh, nowadays, the army can also be uh, an online army, you know, uh, of, of editors. If there's a, a group of editors who want to create a Wikipedia in, in, a, in a specific language or dialect, then it happens. But they have, to have, they have to exist and they have to have access to the, the equipment and they have to be able to afford the, the bandwidth. This is, this is why we have a dismal situation in South Africa. Uh, it's a relatively affluent country, but the cost of doing things online is, 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 is less affordable to the majority than in poorer countries. So this is, this, again, it's a political matter, you know, that our, our government hasn't done what it should have, I, 
I think we can, we can point to politicians being given shares in, in, in cellular t companies and say, well, well, what was that about, you know? Because the, the, then they get more dividends. So if, if the uh, data is more expensive, the, the politicians get more dividends. It's just recently passed 50%, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's debatable because how do you measure when someone's online if they only go online a couple of times a week? You know, they've got an email address, they've got a, a, maybe a Facebook page, and, you know, they, they can hardly ever afford the time. And even the electrical energy, you know, if, if you live off, off the grid, as many people still do in rural areas, you have to go to the shop, usually, with your phone and, ch and pay to charge your phone. So is such a person online, you know, just because they have a Facebook account, which they look at once or twice a week? It's debatable. Um, part of the effort of making internet accessible is we, we're starting to have a movement of community networks in, in South Africa, in rural areas especially, or in, in poor communities. Um, Community-owned telecommunications infrastructure. And sometimes it's solar-powered as well. You know, but it's still in a very early stage of the movement. So, yeah. I think our time is up, hey? Yeah. Uh, I've got a panel, this panel discussion coming up with a bunch of other people about Africa's Wikipedia, so I think we have to... Hmm? This, this is the next, the next thing is... Yes, yes, it's yeah. Okay, so if you want to attend that, just stay where you are, but just give us some time to, to switch over the system. Right.